very good afternoon from sri lanka and welcome back and uh, we are about to start the symposium for a very important symposium on global health where we will be discussing different aspects related to global and public health and here we have a very eminent panel of jha persons and resource persons with us let me first introduce the two jha persons uh, do, uh, dr don eliso losero pisno Uh, from London, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and here uh, we have with me Dr. Deepika Artigala, Senior Health Specialist from World Bank South Asia. First, I would hand over the chair into Dr. Deepika Artigala to give her opening remarks and introduce the first speaker. Or to Dr. Deepika. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Indika. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to co-chair this very important meeting. as professor indika has mentioned so i also would like to welcome you all uh, to the, the last day of this uh, apac conference 2020 so the fourth symposium is the title is global health uh, which is a very uh, important as well as very timely topic so as professor indika has highlighted we have eminent few eminent speakers to enrich on the various aspects of global health so Let me uh, introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Patrick Oswey. So he is going to talk about the pro prospects for health and development in the Asia Pacific region post pandemic. So a brief, very brief introduction of Dr. Patrick. So Dr. Patrick is currently the chief of the Asian Development Bank's health sector group. and also he has been at the forefront of strengthening health system uh, against disease outbreak through uh, innovative multi sectoral approaches for more than 25 years and also prior to his time at adb uh, dr patrick worked as the world bank's global lead of health societies and he has received his medical degree from the university of nairobi and holds a masters of public health from harvard university so over to you dr patrick uh, so as um, as i was reflecting on this uh, conference um uh, i was i was thinking about what what would be the best thing to share with uh, with the members at this particular time uh, in the in, in the health sector and uh, i thought that perhaps uh, we should talk about vaccines because uh, covid vaccines because that's uh, the most topical thing that uh, is being discussed uh, uh, everywhere um as part of a global health initiative uh, that is perhaps the biggest challenge uh, ever faced uh, uh, in the his history of a human race uh, in asia and the pacific um, uh, over the past 50 years there's been very consistent economic growth that has led to uh, increased um, Uh, increased uh, life expectancy across the region and also decrease in some of the um, uh, communicable diseases uh, such that now the our biggest challenge uh, uh, before covid was mostly at, uh, looking at how do we address um, the uh, uh, the cr chronic illnesses uh, uh, the cardiovascular problems uh, and so on and of course still focusing on some of the infectious diseases that we are still have in our region as, as like tb uh, and and so on but what uh, covid has done is basically to uh, challenge uh, how we have been uh, working in the in the health sector and looking at the, to what extent have we been taking care of the vulnerable and at the same time financing uh, health and what has emerged is that um, uh, the financing of health uh, has been fairly uh, uh, not sufficient uh, to prepare countries to deal with the kind of crisis uh, that we are facing and so as 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 we look at what has happened over the past uh, several months um the as the pandemic was uh, uh was was uh, was uh, devastating societies across the region <coughs> uh, as adb uh, we provide we are a development bank that covers uh, uh 49 developing member countries uh, and uh, we provide a significant resources initially to basically look at issues of how do you increase the testing capacity how do you support uh, quarantine contact tracing uh, how do you ensure that um, uh, the population provide is provided with uh, cash assistance uh, uh, because of lockdown uh, and also providing a lot of technical assistance exchanging knowledge and information across uh, various uh, uh, developing member countries with some doing, doing better uh, than others 
uh, sharing knowledge uh, and also collaborating with partners like the World Bank, UNICEF, WHO, and others. Uh, but when it came to uh, uh, it came to looking ahead, uh, and we started seeing the massive in investment that was going on in vaccines, um, the uh, many organisations or the development banks started thinking about how do we prepare for when the vaccines become available. And right now, um, there are all, almost over 250 vaccines that are in trial from animal stages and so on. But in the in the clinical stages, about 40. Uh, vaccines and today about six vaccines have been um, authorized for limited use. This an emergency use or limited use. Uh, for example, the the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine for, uh, that has been approved for emergency use in the UK and also was being discussed uh, uh, in the US uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, but you also have the Russian vaccine that has been uh, but uh, has been provided emergency uh, use authorization in Russia and several about three vaccines in China. So in total about six vaccines that have been approved for emergency use or, uh, or limited use. Now, the bigger question then is, if you look in the horizon, several vaccines are going to come uh, into the market. And the challenge that we're going to face uh, is given that they'll come at various stages and also the, the, the initial phase will be a limited supply. The big question is, um, who is going to get the first vaccine or who are the people that are going to get the first vaccines? Right now, uh, the recommendation by WHO is uh, health workers first uh, because they're at the highest risk and then people with uh, um, underlying conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular problems and so on. So that kind of coordination to happen at the country and agree on how this is going to happen, how this is going to be rolled out is going to be a very, very big challenge. The second challenge, as we see it, is that um, when the vaccines arrive in the country, uh, many of the vaccines uh, require uh, uh, various, uh, require two doses. And so uh, if, if, if uh, in the population, um, you're going to get, the, 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 uh, the population is gonna get the first dose and then they wait three weeks later or four weeks later to get uh, the second vaccine. The challenge is how do you ensure that those who got the first vaccine actually uh, get uh, the second vaccine. So you need a very strong information system uh, to be able to monitor and remind people that the time for them to come for the second dosage. Otherwise, you'll have only people with partial immunity, which is not what you're trying uh, to achieve. Third issue is uh, the issue of cold chain. The cold chain sub, uh, system that we have now is mostly for, for um, uh, childhood vaccines, uh, but uh, this is mostly an adult vaccine. And how do we deal with issues of adults? Children, the parents take them to the clinic uh, quite regularly uh, for, for, for the first or second dose, but the adults, sometimes they have chronic illnesses, they're staying at home, they cannot come to the clinic. So we need to think outside the box. Uh, in our region, um, also the, uh, the uh, uh, countries like India, Pakistan, um, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Korea, they, they are all manufacturers of vaccines. So uh, we are really engaged with them to see how they can ramp up the, uh, the, the, uh, the production of these vaccines to ensure that there are sufficient dosages in our region. And then I'll just the last two that I would like to talk about is the issue of health workers. Who is going to actually uh, uh, deploy or administer the vaccines? In, in, let's just take one specific country where I live in the Philippines. Uh, is 108 million people. The target is to uh, uh, vaccinate uh, 20 million people in 2021. So the question is, um, there's only this and this limited uh, uh, supply of health workers in, uh, in the Philippines. So who is going to administer the vaccine? Uh, the nurses and the doctors and uh, the current health workers cannot manage. And therefore, how do you think outside the box are we going to engage? retired nurses, retired doctors, retired uh, laboratory specialists, are those enough? Or do we need to think about how to engage the community health workers? And if that is, it, uh, if that is how and is that to increase capacity, then what kind of curriculum, what kind of training should they have to be able to be authorized uh, by the Ministry of Health to actually give, inject people with vaccines and so on. So these are all issues that we don't know uh, the answers. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about risk communication. There's a lot of uh, perception that uh, that vaccines will not be safe and uh, many people including um, uh, even health workers themselves many of them when I talk to them they say oh you know I don't want to be the first one to take it I want to see what happens to other people 
And, and so there's there a lot of risk or communication, community engagement and risk communication that would be required as, uh, as we go forward. So as ADB, <coughs> what we are doing is that, uh, um, that actually tomorrow, um, on Friday, we'll be discussing a vaccine uh, package, financing package to support countries to be able to procure vaccines as they become available. It'll be a package of about $9 billion uh, for Asia and the Pacific. And uh, we are also providing about $20 million, which will uh, replenish very quickly uh, to support uh, <coughs> Uh, to support uh, to support technical assistance, basically preparing because countries have to be prepared uh, to be able to uh, to, uh, to uh, deploy the vaccine across the vast uh, the vast countries. So the technical assistance uh, we engaged with many partners, the Australian government, the British government, to, uh, to provide a little bit more resources uh, to work with partners. Uh, we have an arrangement with WHO, UNICEF, and many other organisations uh, to support uh, to support countries. So as we look forward. Uh, just closing, uh, is that uh, <clears throat> I would like to encourage members, uh, uh, your members, that uh, this is uh, the, the greatest public health challenge ever. And we have to think about what is it that you're going to do to make a difference? Uh, how, for example, just take, and if you take a vaccine, what can we do uh, to ensure that the population get the vaccine at the right time, in the right quantities, and that there's sufficient knowledge about these vaccines. Because my greatest fear <coughs> is a situation whereby people get the first vaccine, they don't get the second vaccine, the, the second dose. Uh, and then uh, when you get your vaccine at a primary care clinic, for example, uh, if you have 1,000 people that have gotten vaccines that have gone away, that means that you're keeping 1,000 vaccines in the clinic to wait for them to come for the second time. Other people will come who also want the vaccine, but they'll be told that there's no vaccine, but they, they'll, they'll know that there's some vaccine in the warehouse. Lots of challenges that you have to deal with, with people talking about favoritism and all sorts of things. Why are they not getting vaccines when there's vaccines uh, uh, in storage? So thinking about uh, the, the whole system and bringing in um, uh, our collective uh, effort to think outside the box to sort out some of these challenges. And I close by saying that vaccines alone do not save lives. They do nothing. The only thing that saves life is vaccination. You need to take that vaccine and put it in somebody's arm. That is the only way that we can have, we can prevent and uh, prevent COVID from spreading and deal with this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patrick. Uh, so I think uh, are we to summarize or later? We can, we can uh, take questions later. Yeah. So uh, thank you for enriching the audience of your thoughts on how, uh, how are we to uh, manage or to prepare for the uh, COVAX or the COVID vaccine deployment strategies globally as well as uh, by the countries. So we will take the questions at the end of the uh, uh, session. So may I invite uh, Professor Indika to introduce our second speaker? Uh, thank you and yes, uh, like uh, Dr. Deepika mentioned, uh, we can take questions and the in and also if you want to have ask questions in between, you can use the chat function so that our resource person can respond to your questions because uh, uh, now uh, it looks like that we are discussing million dollar questions like uh, Dr. Patrick has previously provided a lot of valuable information. So the participants are welcome to send your questions in the chat and the resource persons will be providing answers to them. Our next resource person uh, is Dr. Don Eliso Lucero Prisno from uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Don is a leading figure in uh, global health activities. Uh, I would say he is actually a truly international figure. Even though uh, originally from Philippines, he has worked in I think most of the countries in the world, including China and Wuhan and uh, he's the founder of the global health focus or ghf which is basically another health activist organization that is uh, working in many different countries and he has been an ardent supporter of uh, apac as well as the early career network or to don again thank you very much for the invitation uh, for this session which is on global health i wanted to provide 
a scenario of the impact of the pandemic on the SDGs, global health and development, so that we have an overview of what happened, what happened before, and how we are looking forward after this, um, after the vaccines are provided, as, as mentioned by Professor, um, by Dr. Osev. So I'm going to focus on SDGs, global health and development. Prior to the pandemic, we know that we were, we had the shared vision to set the world in a sustainable path for the people, planet, peace, partnership, and prosperity. Though these were the big words of the SDGs, which we started in 2015. And we were one third of the way into, this, into the journey. And in 2019, we had the SDG summit and suddenly came the pandemic of COVID-19. Member states recognized that global efforts were coming up short to deliver that transformational shift by 2030. So we were already in a situation where we are being faced with somewhat inability to move forward faster with the SDGs, which are noble goals which the world have set, has set. Again, there was a renewed international commitment to fulfill the promise and present, uh, to present for future generations. In fact, um, today, 2020, was supposed to be the kickstart of the decade of action, which is the reaffirmation of the global commitment through accelerated efforts. Unfortunately, pandemic came and thus it became a bigger challenge for the world. There were some achievements with the SDGs. I would say some um, because there are still a lot of things that we have to fulfill and we have to, um, to achieve. Global extreme poverty declined, though the pace slowed down. I think our, spokes, our speaker from the ADB and our chairperson of the World Bank would attest to this. 6% of the global population uh, will still be living in extreme poverty in 2030. Thus, we might be missing the target of ending the poverty. So this was the scenario prior to the pandemic. Global maternal mortality uh, declined by 38%, but yet this still has the less than half of the annual rate needed to achieve the global target of reducing maternal deaths to fewer than 70 upper 100,000 live births by 2030. And under five mortality fell by almost 50% from 2010 to 2018. However, there is still a need to accelerate the progress in 53 countries and two thirds of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some of the other achievements, we had achievement in gender equality. Few girls were forced, uh, fewer girls were forced into early marriage and more women in leadership roles. Good achievements, but full gender equality remains unfulfilled. In terms of electricity, there was an increase from 83% to 90% coverage. That means 1 billion people have access to electricity, additional, yet we might still, there will still be 789 million people who might be lacking electricity back in 2018. And um, countries were developing national policies to support sustainable development. And of all these countries, 79 countries and the EU had one national policy instrument on sustainable consumption and production. So there were many good indicators, but yet we were not really fulfilling the pace that we wanted to. And then came the pandemic, we asked the question, will the COVID-19 pandemic threaten the SDGs? This was an editorial in Lancet. I think the big answer, it's a big yes. So the only question now is, how far is the impact and how big is the impact? Can, can we quantify them? Speaking before the APEC PH, probably as academics and researchers and development specialists, we'll be able to quantify the impact of this pandemic. So let us go to some of these, um, of these measures. The world was off track to end poverty by 2030, unfortunately. We have achieved some uh, achievements, but yet it was off track. 
five years into the implementation of the 23 Agenda for Sustainable Development, progress has been uneven and acceleration was needed in many areas. So we were a bit amiss with some of the, of the goals that we were trying to achieve. Food insecurity was already on the rise prior to the pandemic. There was increase in hunger and food insecurity. 690 million people were undernourished in 2019, up by nearly 60 million from 2014. About 2 million people were affected by, by moderate or severe food insecurity. Remember, this was before the pandemic. It, it got much worse during the pandemic until the present. So we have big challenges in front of us. Climate change, prior to the pandemic, it was already occurring more uh, quickly than anticipated. Warmest, uh, second warmest on record in 2019. There were massive wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, floods, and other climate disasters across the continents and global temperatures were on track to rise as much as 3.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. So climate change is one of the challenges. Environment is another. It was still deteriorating, unfortunately. We have done a lot of initiatives, but yet consumption production patterns were not sustainable. Our models of development globally were not the best models in terms of caring for the environment. There's a lot of consumption, a lot of production, and a lot of wastage. Ocean suffered from unsustainable de uh, sustainable depletion. There was a lot of fishing, environmental deterioration, CO2 saturation, and acidification. Forest areas continue to decline. We have been seeing that a lot on the news at an alarming rate. And protected areas were not concentrated, were, in sites known for their biological diversity, species remain threatened with extinction. So those were the challenges with the environment prior to the pandemic. Most of all, as global health uh, specialists, we continue to see inequality. There's a continued increase within and among countries, among the populations. Young workers were try twice as likely to live in extreme poverty than adult workers. So this is not something which, this is a, an indicator that really gives us um, something to think about that it's the young workers who are affected. 85% of people without access to electricity lived in rural areas. And three quarters of stunted children, so this is the nutrition, live in just two regions, which are in Southern Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what are the threats that will reverse the progress in achieving these global goals. The pandemic abruptly disrupted implementation of SDGs. It was very palpable in all our countries. And in some cases, unfortunately, it turned back years of progress. So that was the unfortunate part of the impact of the pandemic. Effects and the measures taken to mitigate it, its impact have overwhelmed health systems globally. Thus, as APEC-PH and as academics, we actually have a lot to research on because of these threats and all of these indicators that have been hurled upon us. It kept up to 90% of student, students out of school, even among our students in public health. We know that we have to do online learning, yet some of them are not being able to access education because of the internet divide. Businesses and factories have to shut down. Global value chains and supply of products have been disrupted. So this will have an effect on, on, on food security. Expected to push 75 million people back into extreme poverty. And this will cause 130 million more people to suffer from under, undernourishment. We all know very well as experts of public health that social determinants of health are very much intertwined with development, with the economy, with the health systems, and so on and so forth. And one of the major questions that have been, uh, that we have faced as development experts is really the value of the measure of poverty. Is it really pegged at that uh, amount of dollars? 
or it should it be higher so that when we measure poverty, so this has been a major question that, that we should be discussing in the future, what exactly is the measure of poverty? Because the one that is uh, provided by the World Bank is probably has been is being questioned. Other threats to the reverse of progress and the goals. There's uh, the world faces the worst economic recession since the Great Depression, with a 4.2 percent expected decline in real GDP per capita. World trade is expected to plunge by 13 percent to 32 percent simply because our workers, there's no demand or there's less demand. Our workers who are working in transport are also affected. Vulnerable countries will be far worse off and FDI could decline by 40% and 400 million job losses globally in the second quarter of 2020. Threats to reverse would be the remittances to LMICs are likely to fall by 20% in 2020. So the lifeline of many of the low and middle income countries would normally come from the remittances of overseas workers in more developed countries. And many of them or a big percentage of them have been asked to go back to their home countries. And so people are unable or afraid to go to healthcare facilities to seek health services. So thus, there will be a spike on illnesses and deaths from communicable and non-communicable diseases because there's a shift of global resources and national resources from all the other diseases to the pandemic. So this will be the impact that we will see later on. I have be recently been revising the modules at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I, I teach uh, global health uh, policy. And we were wondering, like, why do we have to revise it at this moment? Because next year we have to revise it again, and it, it will be a lot of work. So if you would notice, remittances in red has been increasing, but definitely, especially with the Philippines, this will be a big drop in terms of flow of money. As a researcher, as an academic and a global health uh, specialist, we have, been, uh, we have been working on different countries in documenting the impact of the pandemic. And we have seen from our studies that the poorest and the most vulnerable are the most affected. COVID-19 is having an impact, devastating impact on all 17 goals and threatening the achievements already made in many areas. So in other words, as a global community, as a global health community, we will have to do much more work in the coming years. We published with the health planning and management that, and we saw that rural communities in Africa should not be forgotten because they are the ones most affected. So from a global health perspective, we are looking here at inequity and inequality. We did, uh, we did look at testing of, of COVID and we see a lot of challenges in low and middle income countries based on our study, which we published with the Pan-African Medical Journal. We looked at low and middle income countries and how they were doing their initiatives on the pandemic. And most of the time we see the same patterns. It's the lack of testing, inability of the health systems to work or address the outbreaks in their countries. We have seen that in our paper in Malawi. We have seen that in our paper in Sudan. And we have seen that health systems have really been affected. And the level of health systems that they had prior to the pandemic were already overstretched, particularly with countries like DR Congo. This is a paper which we published with the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene that the Ebola had some impact in terms of setting a health system for the pandemic. However, because the new pandemic was just coming in while the previous, while the previous uh, epidemic of Ebola was there, so the health workers were already stretched, the health system was overstretched, and there was lack of funding for such a health system. We looked at the interaction in some countries 
in terms of conflict and COVID-19. Conflict is a major determinant of health and for overstretched health systems such as Afghanistan, it really becomes a big burden to the country and will impact on the population. Adding the migration of Afghanistan uh, population who were working in Iran, moving back to their country, it just added to the problems of the country, including the conflict. Other papers and studies that we have done, we have noticed that indeed the low and middle income countries, the impact of the, of, of the pandemic was really, really massive. And we have provided ev evidences on that, both prior to the <laughs> pandemic, during the pandemic itself, and after, uh, and the way we move forward. So when it comes to disasters, uh, we produce a paper for Lancet. Disasters and the pandemic also have interruptions and it will also affect the health system as we keep on seeing more disasters in the future. In terms of global health programs, polio programs of the world have been affected, particularly in Afghanistan. So this is another study that we did that in 2020, 2019, we are already seeing the spike of, of polio because of the stoppage of the polio program while COVID was there. One, there was a shift of health workers working on polio. There was a shift in the funding and probably the donors will probably bring it down when there is no more, uh, well, there's little money for global health programs. We also have seen in our paper in Pakistan, the effect of the pandemic on the polio program. So these are just examples of, of our studies that we have been doing in global health and how the pandemic affected. In Bhutan, we would see that human resources for health were affected. They had to pull all their trainees from the other countries. And we published this paper in a journal. And this is one of the unique impact of the pandemic. So in other words, in terms of gender, there's an effect on women and girls. In, we also did a study on the effect of sex workers that we really have to look at vulnerable populations and marginalized populations, not only on the mainstream populations who have access to health services. We know that remote learning remains out of reach for at least 500 million students. We did another paper on COVID-19 and health professions education. And we see that it really has an impact on tertiary education, public health education, and we have to mitigate this impact. Thus said, we would need a lot of data as researchers and as academics uh, with APEC PH, we need a lot of data and disaggregate them so we can have uh, granular data that will provide and influence and provide input to policy and practice in global health. So for the recovery, I'm now ending with my presentation. To recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must put people at the center of the response to achieve more equitable and resilient outcomes for all. And the SDGs will be our compass to a transformative recovery that will reduce the risk of future crisis. And it should be inclusive and sustainable development. So thank you very much for the in invitation. I'm supposed to chair this session. Unfortunately, uh, two speakers uh, are not able to present. So I'm, I'm speaking on their behalf. Thank you very much, Professor Indika. Thank you very much. Um, for your thoughts, how we should uh, move forward with our planned STG targets and also highlighting how big the impact of COVID on this in achieving those STGs. So those are the key challenges that we all need to think of when we are planning our future strategies in strengthening the health sector activities. So we have uh, unfinished agenda with infectious diseases, nutrition, uh, reproductive health, and also the non-communicable diseases and associated risk factors. Not only that, but 
the climate change, the trade, so which requires uh, uh, outside the health sector involvement. So all these challenges are there for us to uh, think of when we, we when we are planning uh, in future health engagements. So with that, I take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Srinath Reddy. He is going to um, enrich us with his uh, presentation on prevention and management of NCD in new normal, a global perspective. Let me briefly introduce Professor Srinath Reddy. So, Professor Srinath Reddy is the president, president, Public Health Foundation of India, and formerly headed the Department of <coughs> Cardiology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Professor Reddy is the first Indian to be elected as Warren Associate Member of the National Academy of Medicine of National Academy of Sciences USA. He is presently adjunct professor at Harvard and Emory an honorary professor of medicine at the University of Sydney. So may I cordially invite you, Professor? Uh, thank you very much for this invitation and for the great honor of joining this uh, conference. Uh, I bring greetings from the Public Health Foundation of India and the broader fraternity of public health uh, practitioners and academics in India. Coming to the question of positioning non-communicable diseases in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it would appear that non-communicable diseases had been a late comer in the global health agenda. Indeed, despite the fact that the first iteration of the Global Burden of Disease published in 1993-94 revealed already that NCDs were a huge global contributor to the burden of disease across most regions of the world. And the fact that these were rising in trend did not still get recognition in the Millennium Development Goals, which while focusing on some worthy objectives, nevertheless fragmented health by disease condition and segmented by age. Therefore, what I would call a pandemic in slow motion, the non-communicable diseases did not get the required attention. But then we have seen this has been remedied subsequently by the political declaration of the United Nations in 2011 and SDGs in 2015 did accommodate NCDs and mental health fairly prominently. And in 2018, again, the WHO reiterated its commitment, even in the context of universal health coverage. Therefore, we have to now look at where NCDs lie in this era of a global pandemic, which is rampaging. Those in public health would always agree that health is really indivisible and the artificial divisions between communicable and non-communicable diseases are really not worth fighting over. Nevertheless, there is a tendency among funding agencies and even sometimes among academics to look at these as different entities. But it is very clear, even in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, that NCDs feature very prominently. Indeed, with the comorbidities of non-communicable diseases contributing the largest fraction to severe illness as well as death in COVID-19 in virtually every region of the world, it is very clear that the syndemic, as it's being called, is linking up NCDs integrally even with COVID-19. But that's not surprising. In virtually every other respiratory disease epidemic anywhere in the world, whether it was the previous SARS-1 or whether it is the influenza pandemics that sweep across the world, 
or erupt in countries seasonally, we find that it is persons who are elderly, persons with non-communicable diseases, and elderly with non-communicable disease in particular being at the highest risk, but even people younger with non-communicable diseases as comorbidities falling prey. And when we are looking at respiratory viruses, this becomes particularly evident, but most infectious diseases do claim a higher toll in people with coexisting NCD-related comorbidities. And therefore, trying to divide the global health agenda into communicable and non-communicable diseases is totally meaningless. But we also recognize even in the context of vaccines, which was the first talk delivered in the symposium, that persons who are elderly and people with comorbidities in the form of non-communicable diseases are being prioritized for immunization. But one of the challenges is that everybody with non-communicable disease as a comorbidity is not already identified by the health system. Yes, in some countries, in some urban areas, the health system has been efficient in identifying people with such comorbidities early on. But in many countries, particularly in smaller towns and rural areas or where the health systems have been weak or have not focused attention on NCDs, we will find a large number of people with NCDs as comorbidities who have not been pre-identified and who have not been declared to the health system as now being candidates for prioritized vaccine administration. So NCDs become important even in that context. And then comes the question even of looking at the safety issues. One of the questions that is frequently asked after the vaccine trials, particularly when the trials have limited themselves to persons under 55 years of age, that if immunization is going to be directed to the elderly and people with comorbidities, and if you have actually done most of the safety studies in persons who are healthy volunteers, are the vaccines safe in people with NCD comorbidities? We do not have a clear and convincing answer in many cases. We assume, yes, it will be safe. But these are the questions that invariably bring in NCDs very centrally even into the context of this COVID-19 pandemic, it is not something to be marginalized. But then the question of how do we actually deal even with long COVID comes in? Because it's not just the question of a short-term effect. We find that a large proportion of people are having now long COVID with lungs being affected, with the heart being affected, with the brain being affected. And therefore, they again come in to the context of non-communicable diseases in that sense. And therefore, having, and even the pancreas being affected with diabetes manifesting itself. So long COVID itself now very much enters the territory of non-communicable diseases. Therefore, this intermix is so obvious and we have to get our health systems prepared for that. And in that context, we are also seeing a large number of changes happening in terms of the health system. We are seeing how home care is becoming the norm now for milder cases with COVID because we are not able to flood our hospitals with a large number of people who are infected. And we are also seeing that in that context, the comorbidities of NCDs also have to be co-managed. We are also seeing telemedicine come in when NCD care has been neglected during the COVID era because people cannot go to hospitals either because they fear for their safety or hospitals are already too busy, preoccupied with managing infected COVID patients, the management of conditions like diabetes and hypertension becomes problematic and then telemedicine has stepped in. For example, in India, prior to the COVID pandemic, telemedicine was not legal. People could not actually do teleconsultation because it was decreed by the courts that a patient had to be physically examined before a prescription could be written. But now after COVID-19, it's been fully legalized and is picking up. So there are changes in the health system that are happening. M health and E health are also coming in in a big way. Even for people to be allowed to travel, apps have been developed to find out not only their age and infection status, but also their comorbidity status with NCDs. Therefore, this integration is happening even in the area of health technologies. But then we also recognize that this level of multi-sectoral collaboration that is required in the COVID-19 pandemic 
which is now being seen quite visibly, is also required for NCD care and NCD prevention. And therefore, if multisectoral coordination has now become a reality under the threat of an active advancing pandemic, it is something that can stay on and be crystallized even for routine health system functioning and can be very, very helpful for NCD prevention and control. And there then comes issues like even control of other risk factors like smoking, alcohol, all of which are known to reduce innate immunity. And therefore, again, uh, we are looking at how uh, healthy diets and physical activity, reduced air pollution, all of these also are important for promoting innate immunity to bring resistance to a higher level against infectious diseases. So in the very context of a pandemic, of an infectious disease threat, we are talking about factors which can actually erode or enable innate immunity, which can er erode or uh, um, enable better resistance to fight an infection when it occurs. And all of these are going to be very important elements to push NCD agenda much more prominently into the global health agenda. But even going beyond that, there has been talk uh, by the chairperson herself uh, about climate change being a threat. And in that context, we must also recognize that there are commonalities here. The zoonotic pandemics come in because viruses which are hitherto confined without doing much harm to forest animals get a conveyor belt to enter captive bred veterinary populations which are being used for animal foods uh, for feeding humans and also the large and quite mobile human populations. So we are building conveyor belts through deforestation, urbanization, and if we are to take prevent climate change, we have to take action there as well. Therefore, the co-benefits, apart from co-morbidities, we also need to talk about co-benefits of ecological stability and environmental protection, which is going to be good even for prevention of non-communicable diseases, as well as prevention of zoonotic pandemics. So this particular pandemic gives us a tremendous opportunity now to bring the previously fragmented agenda of global health together onto a common platform where we are looking at society as a whole, looking at individuals through a life course perspective, looking at the over, uh, interplay of communicable and non-communicable diseases. And we are looking at both human health and planetary health in an indivisible manner. And I believe therefore, NCDs offer a great opportunity for steering global health into that composite platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Reddy, for a very uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, so I think uh, we can move towards our discussion. So the floor is open for the discussion and queries and any suggestions. We can get some questions, right? To start with Professor Reddy, I think uh, I take the liberty to start the discussion. So would you like to share your thoughts on One Health policy with regard to uh, NCDs and managing NCDs in uh, post-COVID era? Absolutely. I believe One Health is at critical for preventing zoonotic pandemics and for early recognition of outbreaks and controlling it very quickly uh, through early alert systems. Uh, but that will also give us an opportunity for integrating not only the surveillance system between forest dwelling animals using the forestry departments and the veterinary specialists looking at captive or uh, free living veterinary animals uh, and also human population, but integrating all of that information is absolutely critical to get early alerts and a quick response. And uh, we uh, must promote One Health in that manner. But that will also give an impetus to greater recognition of this connectivity. And therefore, we will be much more likely to achieve success when we plead for stopping or reducing deforestation for various reasons, for reducing the breeding of uh, large animal uh, li in, uh, in livestock breeding by way of factory farming, uh, which will actually, uh, on an industrial scale, uh, which will give an opportunity for zoonotic pandemics to spread easily. So all of these are things that I believe will uh, help 
uh, bring in much better uh, health conditions in not only for infectious disease and pandemic protection, but also for uh, limiting climate change as well as reducing the burden of non-communicable diseases. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, sir. Oh. Yeah. Uh, anyone from the participants, if you want to ask any questions, you can make either chat or you can comment. Any of you want to make any comments? Uh, okay. In the while the questions are coming in, uh, one question from uh, Dr. Patrick. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Patrick, uh, what are the plans of ADB uh, in supporting the, the <coughs> developing countries or low middle income countries uh, regarding uh, obtaining the vaccine? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, yeah. What What are the plans of the Asian Development Bank to support the low middle income countries and low income countries in obtaining the vaccine once it gets through the trials? So the, the plan is uh, fairly straightforward. <clears throat> Um, because we are the largest development bank uh, in Asia and, and the Pacific, um, and uh, because we've supported uh, economic growth over the past almost 60 years now, uh, we've been quite concerned that uh, uh, if we do not address uh, the issue of the pandemic, uh, the, we are, we, the country is actually going backwards in terms of economic development. Uh, and the best way to, uh, um, to ensure confidence uh, and for the economies to start um, uh, uh, improving again is uh, to make vaccines uh, available at whatever stage. So <clears throat> um, we, our, our financing facility of $9 billion uh, is to all the 49 uh, developing member countries. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, we, but we also recognize that uh, there's a significant amount of preparation that is required. So we have significant amount of grants uh, that uh, we are providing. And uh, we are working closely with entities that are very much uh, involved in vaccinations at WHO and, uh, uh, and um, uh, UNICEF uh, to, so that they can also expand their capacity looking at issues around prioritization, who's going to get it first, uh, 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 organizing, coordinating entities with the, between Minister, uh, with the Ministry of Health uh, and also supporting cold chain. So it's, it's flexible depends on what the country wants to do. Uh, and there's a very rapid uh, financing to ensure that uh, uh, countries are able first, either if they want to go through the global facility of COVAX, uh, they can uh, purchase vaccine through COVAX. Uh, if they want to do a bilateral deal with a pharmaceutical company, that is also acceptable. Of course, recognizing that uh, there's a shortage of vaccine in the market. So countries might be able to get it more through COVAX or if they have, uh, if, if, if they already have partnership with any of the pharmaceutical companies, they can also get it directly. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Now I would like to ask from Dr. Deepika because World Bank was very much involved in supporting the member countries during the COVID pandemic. If you want to explain in detail what were the activities and what was expected yeah. and what are the priority areas. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Indika. I think in brief, so World Bank is also supporting like ADB uh, to combat this uh, pandemic situation globally. So the globally, they have set aside, I think 20, 12 billion USD uh, for this particular purpose under the fast track facilities. So countries will apply and we'll be able to get the uh, funding resources. Not only the funding, but the technical uh, know-how also is available. Basically, the tool that was developed with WHO, UNICEF, and World Bank, vaccine assessment, uh, vaccine readiness as assessment framework is now uh, uh, introduced uh, to, to do this uh, analytical work to uh, assess their situations country-wise, as well as to cost some of those components like uh, strengthening of cold chain facilities, uh, the, uh, the vehicles, the training components. So the country will be able to get an idea of what are the financial gaps, not only the financial gaps, I would say, what are the gaps that are there for them to, um, uh, needs to be strengthened in order to uh, go with this new vaccine deployment. Not only the new vaccine deployment, as well as to strengthen the available immunization program also uh, could be addressed through these uh, measures because it's altogether a common uh, immunization programs in the country level. Uh, 
so this tool will help the countries to identify their challenges their bottlenecks and their gaps as well as the financial gaps also so based on which they will be able to uh, uh, mobilize their own local resources or if required they can get some additional finances with the development partners such as from the world bank and adb uh, unicef and who world bank adb is working together i think working together is one of the key strengths uh, to uh, address this uh, pandemic situation uh, or the emergency situation so uh, there are a lot of things are happening at country level as well as the global level so they are re they are ready to support the countries based on their requirement and based on their need so country to country the strategies may be uh, uh, different uh, so uh, the resources are there based on the country's plan so they can um, uh, request uh, uh, the, the necessary support from those development partners uh, thank you uh, professor indika uh, so and I, uh, maybe uh, yes, sir, Indika, yes, I can yes, can yes, I add something yes. with the vaccine? So yes, uh, we are doing a study on 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 vaccines and vaccination programs, and these are the a few things that we have uh, we have seen which are quite important. One is the cost. The vaccine is not really cheap. The cheapest so far that that is being rolled out is actually 30 US dollars. And it would even go per vaccine and probably it will go higher. Uh, that is more or less what is the current uh, thing price that we are seeing. So giving it double will really be very expensive. So that's one, the cost. But luckily we have the facilities like COVAX, the World Bank is putting in money, governments are putting in money. So cost is trying to be addressed at the global level. The other thing is the preparedness of the health systems of different countries. Because most of the health systems, as we have seen in our uh, work with Africa, is mostly on pediatric delivery system. It's not on adult. And we have to uh, give vaccines to a bigger part of the adult population for this vaccine, especially that it affects the older population. We don't have that system yet embedded, so thus it becomes additional cost to the, to the health system of every country. So that's one, the cost, the preparedness of the health system. The third is uh, the vaccine itself, the, the product. Because if the, the cold chain would need an extremely very low um, temperature, it will be more expensive for the different countries, especially that we have to address electricity, so on and so forth. Distribution in rural areas in Africa and in Asia would be a lot of challenges. What would add or help would be the, the facility that we already have established with polio, for example, in Pakistan, in, um, in Afghanistan, luckily during the pandemic, we were able to eradicate polio in, in um, Africa. So that was the, good, the only good news in vaccination during the pandemic. So that might help in terms of the health systems preparedness, but we still have a bigger challenge in terms of vaccination. And also, will the vaccine be effective in the long run? Because as we keep on giving vaccines to the populations of the world, we will look at the, the efficacy of all these vaccines. Back to you. Thank, thank you, Professor Don. Yeah. Uh, any comments from uh, Professor Srinath Reddy? Yeah, may I come in uh, on the price? Yeah, this is Patrick. Yes, yes, yes please go ahead. Yes, the, uh, I, I've talked to almost all the big pharmaceutical companies uh, to, uh, to explore with them the, the issue of pricing. And the AstraZeneca vaccine is actually five dollars uh, per dose. Uh, the, the new technologies, um, uh, which is the mRNA virus, and those are the more expensive because it's a new technology. So the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine is, uh, is about twenty dollars. And uh, the Moderna vaccine uh, is about uh, $32. So um, the, I just wanted to uh, provide that information. Thank you. Well, uh, as we speak, uh, 64 heads of embassies in India are heading towards the city of Hyderabad, my hometown, though I don't reside there any longer because of the huge vaccine manufacturing capability there. 
and uh, it is expected that some of the vaccines that are being produced there, whether developed in India or licensed to India for manufacture, will be available at comparatively less prices. But certainly, as has been stated, the cold chain requirements can be sometimes forbidding and that can be problematic. But it's likely that over the course of the next six months, we may well have several vaccines, first wave of vaccines and second wave of vaccines, uh, which will be more affordable. And we may even have single dose vaccines and even inhalable vaccines, which will confirm mucosal immunity and not just a, not a, just a uh, systemic vaccine, which fights off in a, uh, severe illness, but doesn't necessarily stop the infection from entering the body. So we are, uh, with caution, looking at uh, multiple candidates becoming available over the next one year. So if the initial protection can be provided to people who are elderly, vulnerable, and also the essentiality criteria of people like health workers and other essential workers, if they can be met with available vaccines, over time, I believe we will get access to more vaccines which are less problematic in terms of logistics and also more affordable in terms of pricing. Can you move into a different area where uh, Professor Reddy is also an expert on? Now, during the pandemic, uh, one thing that was noticed, an issue that was highlighted throughout this conference and during this symposium also, that other diseases and NCDs getting less attention, the management and a uh, lot of patients with NCDs, they have less access to the healthcare. So those conditions get neglected and that could be another issue in the future. Professor Reddy, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, what are the, because it seemed to be a global problem and a regional issue as well. Entirely, sir. I mean, I, as far as the NCD care is concerned, it has certainly been a setback, whether it in terms of chronic continuous care or whether even in terms of procedures being performed in hospitals, where hospitals have been overcrowded. And even people have been reluctant to go to hospitals because they don't want to contract the infection in a hospital. So there has been a definite setback. But as I said, uh, there has been some innovation as well with telemedicine coming in, with home care coming in, a little more organized primary care, healthcare services are also responding to the situation. And we need to continue that in the future. But uh, certainly there has been a neglect and we'll have to see what the immediate consequences of that are going to be for some time. Uh, but uh, fortunately, at least as far as India is concerned, we have not seen any documented surge in NCD related deaths during this period. Yeah. yeah. Um, Professor Reddy, so I just want to uh, ask you about this telemedicine that you have highlighted during your presentation. So do you think that this is going to be a good option for us to think for the post-pandemic era as well? I think telemedicine is part of the solution, not the sole solution. Because I think telemedicine cannot operate if there are no people on the front lines in the primary health care to actually report on what is required in terms of the care needs and then get the right kind of advice to implement uh, there. Uh, it can be a supplement and a useful supplement uh, to primary health care services, but it cannot uh, sort of replace it. Uh, it cannot substitute for it. So I think bringing in that kind of connectivity is going to be very important. Uh, it cannot, we, can, we cannot dilute the health workforce requirements there. Thank you, Professor Reddy. We are getting some questions through the chat also. And one question is actually, I mean, uh, rather challenging one. If I may read out, uh, could the presenters give an estimate of timeline until population coverage is achieved? So I don't know whether there is a <laughs> possible answer for that. But if you want to make any comments, Maybe from uh, Dr. Patrick or Don or Dr. Srinath or anyone, any of the experts in the audience? Sure, okay. I, can, I can start. Uh, yes, please, Don. I think, yes, uh, coverage would mean many things. Um, I think what, what, they, what, what he or she meant is, is it the vaccination of the population? The, yeah. Okay. I, I suppose oh. it's the vaccination yeah. coverage. Yes. Yes. Oh, de definitely it would depend on a number of factors. One, the availability of the vaccine, if they will have access to, um, to the vaccines because they have to be produced uh, by different countries 
those who are producing the vaccines. And there's a long queue, of course, to if there's enough money for to buy the vaccines, because that will be um, that will be a major factor. And based on the current pronouncements of some governments, they would not want to give the vaccines yet because they want to see the effects of the vaccines in other countries. They are trying to be smart. So some of these countries are trying to hold on giving the vaccines to the population because from the perspective of global health, this is geopolitics, the vaccines, we have to admit it. It's a power, I, I'm, I'm looking at the lens of, of, from the global health lens here. It's, it's geopolitics, whether it's a Russian vaccine or a Chinese vaccine or an American vaccine or a British vaccine. And that's also a sort of power. But yet we don't know the, the impact of this. So, so other countries are looking, at, um, are looking at, at this. Also the preparedness of the health system, as I mentioned, or else the vaccine will get into waste if, if they are not properly delivered to the population. So there will be a lot of factors. And most of all, as a challenge to the low and middle income countries, it's really the cost, whether it's, it's five US dollars, that's just the cost of the vaccine, or 30 US dollars per vaccine times two, then that's really a lot for, for low income countries. That's too much for a population, for example, of 50 million. That's a lot of money. So that would really depend on, on these factors. Well, if I may come in on this, Please. I completely agree with uh, what's been said. But I would like to say that we should not depend only on the vaccines for containing this pandemic. We have to continue our public health measures strongly as well. And one of the things that may help us reduce the requirement of vaccines over a period of time is if we actually maintain our public health measures like masks, physical distancing, and avoiding, most importantly, super spreader events, we will create a bumpy road for the virus to travel. And that may actually bring in the force of evolutionary biology, because even the viruses have been known to become less virulent in order to continue their own species, because they cannot afford to exhaust their host species. Uh, for example, the H1N1 virus which was responsible for 50 million deaths world over in 1918 to 1920, came to visit us again in 2009, but in a much more milder form. We do not know how much time it takes for the viruses to become less virulent uh, in, because of evolutionary biology. But the more we protect ourselves from giving the virus the free reign to ride, the better it is for us, and we should continue our public health measures along with the possible access to vaccines. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Eddie, for coming out with that very, very valuable <laughs> comment. I have another <laughs> question from you related to that. Now, uh, because of that interest about the vaccine, and sometimes some believe in, sometimes maybe the general pub public believe in that vaccine is the cure for everything. That's the magical formula. Or worse still, uh, there may be some beliefs, especially in our part of the world, related to some, say, uh, superstitious beliefs or magical formulas that will cure the disease or will prevent the disease. All, all these things are very, very common. And these things might be uh, diverting the attention from the basic public health measures, such as keeping the physical distancing, cleanliness, and the respiratory etiquette, so on and so forth. But the problem perhaps is those simple messages are not very attractive. So how can you address this problem? Well, I think the messaging actually becomes much more effective when we involve the community networks. Quite often in countries, the messaging is very good in terms of beaming out through mass media by opinion makers, political leaders, and so on. But all the doubts and the false beliefs and the mythologies get propagated at the community level. Unless we start actually engaging the community networks much more effectively, we will not be able to break the cycle of misinformation. And that is the missing piece in many countries now, because it's often a top-down approach rather than a community network approach. 
Therefore, I would like to call for people-partnered public health as the new PPP. Yeah, yeah. We, we sincerely believe these wise words will be heard and followed. Yeah. Dr. Yes, I think you are very uh, right, Professor Reddy. I think stigma uh, among the yes. population or the communities is one of the key challenges that we are facing with when we are managing this COVID. Uh, so the risk communication and the empowering the community, the conveying the correct messages is uh, one of the key. It's very crucial for us to have, a, a, to bring uh, to a control of this COVID. Uh, but I don't think that it is uh, happening at the scale that it should be. We are focusing on managing the clinical management and the vaccination and the other, uh, mainly the clinical part of the uh, scenario rather than giving a less priority. I don't know, I may be wrong, the less priority for the uh, community engagement or the addressing the communities. Yeah, over to you. And uh, another aspect since uh, there is a World Bank as well as the Asian Development Bank. Now, uh, many many of the resource persons are mentioning about the health system development and health system capacity building. In addition to the community capacity building, probably health system capacity building is also required. And there may be some relearning and perhaps some unlearning also may be required at this situation. We are and unprecedented challenges engulfing the region and the world. What are your thoughts? I mean, what the, the UN agencies and World Bank, ADB, yeah. what, what can you do? I think Professor Indika, you are very right. Uh, I think this is a very uh, a good time for us to think of this primary, uh, strengthening the primary care services. Uh, basically with the uh, NCD burden or the N NCD disease burden. So we, the countries are, uh, putting more efforts on the primary care strengthening. So I think this is another great opportunity for us to think of, to, to strengthen the, not only the non-communicable diseases, but to uh, the control, the communicable diseases also through primary care strengthening is a very, very important thing. So this is, I, I personally believe that this is a great opportunity for us to strengthen the primary care services at grassroots level in order to address both those challenges, communicable diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases. When it comes to the vaccination programs also, so some countries may decide to uh, deploy those vaccination program at grassroots level, maybe the community-based clinics. Some may go for the hospital-based clinics. Some may do both. So whatever the strategies that they're going to imply, but uh, strengthening the primary care services would be a very strong foundation for us to move forward with these agendas. Dr. Patrick, would you like to make any comments related to yes. that from there? I agree, I agree. Uh, and uh, um, the, I think that if you look at countries that have done very well uh, with this pandemic, Sri Lanka, for example, um, uh, it's because of very, very strong uh, primary care. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, these are countries that were very much prepared and, um, and uh, the, they were able to, uh, right from the beginning, to be able to trace track and test uh, 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 people. So I think that uh, uh, what this has underscored is that um, uh, the, the the approach to universal health coverage, ensuring that this access to uh, that the access to health, uh, uh, supporting primary care to the nearest uh, lowest level, I think uh, is that it should be top priority. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, Dr. Patrick. So can we get some comments from? the experts who are in the participant group also. Anyone who want to make comments? Uh, Professor Indy, can you ask a question? This is Don. Yes, Don, please, yes. Yes, yeah. um, allow me to ask my question. Uh, this is a question for uh, Patrick, or uh, the representative from the World Bank and uh, Asian Development Bank. When we measure poverty, we peg it at a certain amount of, of, of US dollars. And there have been lots of criticisms that this should not have been the measure of, of poverty. It should have been much higher because when pandemic came, we suddenly saw that even the middle income, uh, middle income uh, populations totally uh, had difficulties in, in addressing uh, their, their lives during the pandemic. What do you think uh, should be the the way to measure poverty 
when it comes to uh, the amount? Should we increase it so that because the the, the repercussion is um, when we put it at a lower level, at a lower amount, everyone, the governments are complacent that they don't want to work harder anymore because everyone graduated from poverty. And then suddenly pandemic came and then everyone was faced with this problem. So I want to hear your opinion from the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. I think I'll defer to my World Bank colleague for this. So I think uh, I may not be the best person to answer this question because I'm a health specialist, not the uh, economist. So, however, I know that there are various uh, methodologies uh, there are to assess the poverty levels. So, bank is uh, doing uh, with their own uh, uh, calculations with their experts and uh, considering the country's uh, scenarios. But I agree with um, Dr. Don, right? It may be the how you interpret those things and the practical consequences of these uh, uh, the, the levels and the graduation of those levels will vary country to country. So we need to think uh, all these factors uh, holistically when we think of uh, moving forward with. Uh, so I think my comment would be that. Thank you. I think uh, maybe our Dr. Patrick will uh, add on something to the discussion. No, I, I think that's the uh, the. Uh, Dr. Don, the you know the poverty uh, the, the, the uh, cutoff was uh, was uh, doubled only about uh, a few years ago, and uh, we also have to look at the, the economic growth of various countries, uh, the GDP of various countries, uh, and uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, uh, it's 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 very difficult um, uh, to um, to to reach a consensus on. Because if you're saying a dollar ninety a day, um, uh, that is uh, uh, that is if you multiply that by per month or per year, um, that's 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 that you consider that fairly low. But at the same time, there are many parts of the world where people are earning zero, and therefore, if you want to create a standard deviation and uh, and also come up with what what would be the cutoff of where you think someone has a livable wage. Uh, within their context, so it's 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 a, it's a complex issue that requires uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, analysis, and I think that that I would say uh, is, uh, is 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 beyond my my capabilities in terms of commenting. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask from uh, uh, yeah my, one of the maybe executive committee members of the APAC. Professor Bruce Maycock, what do you think? I mean, what does all these messages and the expert opinion tells us? Is it a return to the basic preventive measures and public health? Bruce, over to you. Hey, hey, Andrew. Um, thank you for that. For those who are looking at the, um, at those that are looking at the uh, group chat, I've just sent a, a message which really um, reflects back on the session we had um, a little while ago about the concept of new normal. And um, with the UK releasing its vaccine and doing a lot of press release and um, TV and other things about, you know, elderly patients being the first to get their uh, vaccination, my sense is that there's uh, a growing um, belief that the end is in sight. And um, what this session for me has really highlighted is the fact that that end is, is not in sight. There are so many barriers and that the real takeout message has to be that the public health approach has to remain particularly strong um, and even more nuanced as we move forward. And the thing that we want, need to avoid is the issue about false hope because that could actually start to undermine the, the public health messages. Thank you, Bruce, and seem to be loud and clear. Yes. Uh, before we finish, can we get the concluding remarks from our three resource persons? Because everything that we have discussed is very valuable and uh, shows the future path the other way forward. Can we take the three resource persons one by one and maybe the take home message that you want to highlight? 
we can start from Dr. Patrick, I think. Yes. Just to say that, uh, and you underscore what uh, a colleague has just said that uh, the vaccine is not uh, the sol is, is not the only tool uh, in the toolbox uh, to address this pandemic. It's a good one, uh, but um, uh, it's uh, we have to continue uh, implementing the public health measures. Uh, I think that my my greatest fear is that uh, uh, people start being complacent and saying that uh, with a vaccine now they'll start uh, engaging high risk behavior. There's still a lot that we don't know about. Uh, uh, like has been said, uh, some people uh, might have the vaccine, they're there, they're protected, but they're still infecting others. So I think that is important uh, that uh, the messaging should be very clear that uh, we have a partial solution. We need to still continue with our public health measures. Over to you. Professor Don, or uh, Professor yes. Inath Reddy. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And since this is the APEC PH, a group of educators and academics, I would like to emphasize the role of research in, in doing our work, the role of education and providing good information, and that we have to look at phenomenon in public health and global health, that they are new ones, and we should not see them uh, from just one perspective. And that's actually the beauty of what we do in public health education and global health education. When we dissect a phenomenon such as this, and that there are different perspectives, and probably that is the skill and a way forward in how we teach our students when we look at these different issues from a, from a, in public health and global health. So that is one thing I want to emphasize in this talk. And we have a lot of work to do. We have done much, but I think there are still more challenges. And through our collective effort, we can all achieve these goals. Professor Srinath Reddy. Well, I think the message is fairly clear that in a highly interconnected and interdependent world, we have to look at global health as a platform for building global solidarity. We need a global thrust to counter any global threat, whether it is an acute pandemic or climate change or the pandemic of non-communicable diseases. All of us are very vulnerable and no country is safe till every country is safe. Therefore, public health is the platform on which global solidarity and sustainable development can be built. And that is the message that we should look at, not merely as a temporary knee-jerk response to a, a pandemic situation, but as a continuing platform for unified action. Thank you, Professor. So, message is very clear. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the three resource persons for their precious and valuable sharing of the knowledge and the expertise and all the participants for their very active participation. I'd like to hand over my uh, co chairperson Dr. Deepika Artikale, for her concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Professor Indika. And may I also convey a very big thanks to all our excellent three speakers for enriching us with various aspects of this global health. Uh, so just to, again, to maybe reiterate, I think as Dr. Patrick has mentioned, the vaccine is not only the solution, the vaccination is important. So how do we do this vaccination? So we need to think very carefully. And then Dr. Don has uh, highlighted the importance of the role of research, having good information and public health and the global health perspectives. I think having good information is very important and translating this information into practice is also very equally important. So for us to think of, to revisit our strategies, how we could translate this available information into practice is a very timely. And finally, our Professor Reddy, he has highlighted very many important things and non-communicable diseases. Uh, asking not to divide non-communicable diseases with communicable diseases because it has an uh, interrelationship. So uh, just to reiterate, so finally, the no country is safe till every country is safe. So this is the conclude. I think this is what we need to conclude this Global Health Symposium. So this is very important. There are many aspects 
which are interlinked. So we need to think outside the box to collect those synergies and to strengthen the uh, intersectoral collaboration uh, towards achieving our set targets or to bringing the well-being of the global population, the global community. With that, I would like to conclude our symposium. Have a nice day. Thank you.